Chapter 17 Under the white cross on the hill sat Deborah and Stephen. He was voluble, she was silent. "'Well, if you won't, you won't,' he was saying. "'But why you consider it wrong for me to kiss your arm when I've kissed your mouth, Lord only knows.' He threw sticks crossly at a huge green caterpillar crowned with gold that was crawling in the short grass. "'Donna hurt it, Stephen.' Stephen saw his chance. "'I'll stamp on it if you don't let me kiss your arm.' "'Oh, well,' Deborah spoke wearily. "'Oh, stop. There's Joe and Lil.' "'Hello, Joe,' shouted Stephen. "'What's that about the newlywed?' Joe sang out the rest of the couplet with enjoyment to the discomfiture of Deb and Lily. They shook their way through the solitudes where innumerable sheep tracks crossed and recrossed, Joe leading unerringly. The two girls dropped behind. "'Well, Lil? Well, Deb?' Sheep cried through the clear air. The two young men tramped in front, full of the pride of life, whistling, mimicking the sheep, quelled when they paused for the girls by a get along do well lil said deb again after a long silence she said it pleadingly insistently she was like one that sets out on a long journey and waylays other travellers to ask for short cuts well echoed lily blandly and with an aggravating pretence of denseness she remembered deb's quiet scorn of her carryings on she was enjoying herself deborah sighed I thought, she said sadly, as being friends and that, and me lending you my blue bonnet, and being Joe's sister and all, you'd have told me. Well, Deb, Lily replied with icy superiority, I never thought you was one of them prying, curious girls. Oh, no, cried Deb hurriedly, only, what? You know, I've thought time and again of being an old maid. Lily laughed. Well, shall I or no? You softy. "'But I want to decide, Lil.' "'He'll decide,' answered Lily concisely. "'Oh, you needn't worry your head. "'Oh, all that'll be left to you is... "'What? Let's sit down, Lil.' "'You'll know all in good time,' said Lily. "'Are you two coming, or are we to come and fetch you?' shouted Stephen. "'Coming,' cried two voices hastily. "'Now then,' said Stephen, "'you old married folk trot on in front.' "'I like that,' chuckled Joe. "'And what about you?' "'We'll follow at our leisure,' replied Stephen. "'I bet you do.' The interminable winding valleys lay beneath in broadening vistas. Their steep sides were clad in amethyst, blue, gold, amber, crimson, copper, infinite colours overlaid by the violet gauze of cloud shadows. All down their way stood foxgloves, and Stephen fitted a flower on each of Deborah's fingers. With them went a stream, rocking on its swift waters the yellow cradles of the mimulus, where tiny shadows slept. The hills closed in round them. The far prospect was gone, then the near view, then the ramparts in front. Finally nothing remained but their own narrow way, multicolored, cricket-haunted, with a roof of blue sky laid across the hills above, like a sheet of paper. Deb, said Stephen, let's sit down. I want to talk to you. The atmosphere of joy round Joe was too much for him. He pulled the mimulus to pieces. Deb, I want to ask you a big thing. She shut her eyes and the sun fell on her calm face as it falls on a field of ripe wheat. I want to ask you, Deb, he went on, his voice trembling a little with suspense and eagerness, if you'd live with me without... He paused. The enormity of the thing in her eyes and in the eyes of her people suddenly appeared to him but he was not of the kind to hesitate. Without marriage, he finished. Deborah lay back, motionless. You see, he went on, very anxious to explain, it's such a mockery to me now, this last week, all that. I don't believe in it, and it seems such rot, and I always did hate fuss and promises and to be tied down. His eyes took their restless look. Sooner than that I'd shoot myself, he added, with the rash certainty of one who has never touched a gun. If you'll take me, Deb, I swear to you here and now that you'll never repent it. I'll love you far more than wives are loved, and be faithful to you forever and ever. What the hell's that? A loud, raucous, mocking laugh, rather like Eli's, had rung out far above them. Only the grouse, said Deborah. What a din! It startled me. He was rather ashamed of his superstitious fear. Well, what do you say, Deborah? Oh, I don't know. It's all dark, Stephen. 
but it's no different really. If people love each other, they stay together whether they're married or not. If they don't, they don't. Deborah saw that clearly. What she did not see was his temperament, his way of shifting as the wind does before a storming night, of striking out wildly here, there, like a giant in the making, of dashing after every butterfly of a new idea, as a poet does in his crude youth. Oh, said Deb hopelessly, it couldn't be. There's father and mother. What do they matter if you've got me? He stood there in stately youth like a sapling by the water. And Joe! What does Joe matter? He's got his own boat to steer. He'd leave her see me dead. Why? Well, about here, you see, we set a lot of store by marriage. Wed and gray's white. Dunna wed and white's black. Of course, if you think more of Joe than me. Oh, you know I dunna. Well, then, it was his own incorrigible reasoning. And the neighbors, Mrs. Shakeshaft and all. We'll go off together and let them say their silly say. And Eli, her face grew quite rigid as she thought of his creaking voice upbraiding her, calling her a sinner. Damn, Eli! And Deborah took her courage in both hands. And me? You? he questioned. I, me. I'm like other women, and I want what they want, a ring, and to be Mrs. Her lip trembled. Well, he said with young egotism, if I'm not enough to make up for that, I'm sorry. He turned away. Oh, dunna go, Stephen, dunna. Let me think a bit. I don't like half-hearted givers, said Stephen coldly, for he was very eager, and her hesitation tortured him. I'm not, I'm not, cried Deborah, deeply hurt, for generosity was her strongest instinct. She stood up, very straight and gracious in the blue delaine. The tower-like hillsides became a mere background for her. The colors grouped themselves behind her like meek waiting maids. She stood like the goddess of some rich land. Her eyes were tender, agonized, and haughty. Stephen, she said, as he looked at her with bent head, and both hands out towards her. Stephen, I'm no niggard. If I give, I give without stint, and of the best I've got. But the heartbreak and the sorrow as you're bringing on them, my love, is almost more than I can bear. Do you love me true, Stephen Southernwood? Yes, Deborah. Will you love me on to the last turning and the end of the road? Yes, he said rather impatiently. Do you want me so bad that you're lost without me? There was a note of wistfulness in her voice. Of course. Oh, Deborah, say yes. Stephen, she said, with her father's unhurried utterance, are you certain sure? Before God I am, he cried, with truth, for he was at that moment. But he did not realize that he was dynamic while she was static, and that the crash of such temperaments is wilder than the crash of worlds. Then, Stephen, she said with a clear look at him standing in a pool of shadow, then you can ask me. He flung himself at her feet. Will you be my sweetheart, Deborah Arden, and my mate, and the love of my life? She put out a hesitating hand and touched his hair damp on his forehead. "'What a lad you are,' she murmured motherly. "'Answer, Deb,' he said passionately. "'I, I'll be your sweetheart,' she said softly, "'and your mate till I lie in the daisies and the love of your life while life lasts.' A wandering seed of thistledown drifted slowly across the coombe, very high up from one steep to another without descending, as if it walked on an airy bridge to an airy destiny. And now, Deborah said, let's go on to the others, for I have no more to give and no more to say for a while. But, Deb, I was just going to kiss you. Not now, not just after that. I just leaf kiss in church. It's a new road we've started on, Stephen, she added, with this sense of desolation creeping over her again. A new road, and it may be a weighty one. Never lose my hand, lad. Never, not for all the old devils up yonder, said Stephen, nodding in the direction of the devil's chair, hidden from them now, but set high above the country like a black pearl in a troubled sea of mist, for the thunder had come round and muttered in the west. The grouse laughed again. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Yo-ho! came Joe's voice from far down the path. "'Well, you laggards!' he bawled as they came up. "'The path's so twisty,' said Stephen. 
The path's straight now. Joe looked at Stephen contemplatively. There's no wrong with the path, he added, but maybe you're a twisty walker, Southernwood. Deborah sighed. As the last valley widened and the hill swung back, they heard the distant plaintive music of the merry-go-round at Shepwarden, like a bee in a jam pot. They came down the quaint street by the old market, where fruit was set out so temptingly that Joe bought two enormous melons, which he carried under his arms. The street was full of country folk, interspersed with visitors who hoped to attain the peace of the countryside without its toil. Strings of hill ponies went by, droves of bullocks, sheep with red letters on their shorn bodies. Joe steered for the merry-go-round, and Deborah saw above the crowd, above Joe, above everything in the world, she thought, Stephen's bright head and keen face, eager for joy. "'Good morning, Mrs. Arden,' said Lucy Thruckton primly. She was sitting on the grass with a bottle of ginger beer. "'Hello, Joe,' shouted various friends. One irrepressible from beyond Lost Within, seeing the melons, called out, "'So you've brought the twins!' "'If you be Market Peart, Charlie Camlin, you need not blazon it.' "'Be you coming, Lucy?' asked Deborah as they took their seats on the merry-go-round. "'No, I'm thinking it's a toil of a pleasure.' Deborah thought that many pleasures were like that. Eli came up. He was here to look for a housekeeper and had been treated with contumely by two ladies upon stating his terms. He was annoyed. "'Turn ye, turn ye,' he intoned, coming up to them just as the hobby horses started. "'We be,' said Joe, amazed at his own wit, "'as fast as ever we can.' There was a roar. They began to move to the tune of, "'Oh, where is my lad tonight?' Eli stumped off. Stephen's eyes were ablaze. He loved quick motion, music, color. He had an arm around Deborah, and the more excited he was, the more like iron it grew. Oh, Stephen, she pleaded, loose me go. But he was beside himself with excitement, the fulfillment of his emotional and poetic love of beauty and crude life. I won't, he said. Oh, Dewey, Stephen, you're hurting me. The merry-go-round was in full swing, racing madly, the music at its loudest and quickest. He bent down. Deb, he shouted with his mouth close to her ear, his eyes holding hers, dominant, flashing blue fire. Deb, when? You're hurting me, Stephen. Then say. Oh, Stephen, and you said you were fond of me. I tell you it's because I'm fond of you. He spoke in a hard voice, holding her tighter. His logic seemed unanswerable to him. He was without Joe's dumb apology for the ways of nature. His arm never slackened, though the tune did. He had no idea where he was. He was so intent on his desire. Say when, he repeated. I don't know what you mean. That's a lie. He jumped from the roundabout before it stopped and disappeared. Deborah felt faint. She had no compass to help her in this extraordinarily stormy sea, and she was frightened. Lily immediately alleged that she felt faint, too. "'Dear sakes, what a gawk I am,' said Joe. "'I never ought to have let you go on.' "'By the faintness of the young women,' said the roundabout proprietor with camaraderie, "'the chapels is filled.' He nudged Joe in the ribs. "'Some folks have no manners,' said Lily. Lucy Thruckton gaped in happy bepuzzlement. Lily was annoyed at her air of being above all these things, possessed of herself alone. Lucy, she asked sweetly, should you like a lover? Aye. And a wedding ring? Aye. And a veil? Aye. And a cow to give you quarts and quarts of milk? Aye. And children to do the work for you? Aye. Well, said Lily, with a fox-like snap of her small teeth, you won't never have none of them, so there, you fat thing. Deborah sat drearily with Lucy while Lily and Joe wandered about. At last she saw Stephen in the distance. He was coming towards her. Both his hands were full of roses, such roses as she had never possessed, for it was cold on the hills. He must have spent half a week's pay on them, she thought, horrified. He flung them, crimson, honey-colored, pink, into her lap and himself on the ground. I'm a beast, he said, a frightful beast. I won't do it again, Deb. I'll be a good boy. He looked up with humility in his eyes. She found the humility delicious. There, there, she said. It's all right. Only do get up, she added, surveying him with almost jealous pride. Folks are staring. 
He got up. And now, he said, selecting a fat red rose and presenting it to Lucy with a kindly little smile, here's one for Miss Thruckton. He had noticed Lucy's clouded face. Perceptiveness was one of his gifts. He could not bear that anyone's joy should be dimmed. Joy was so fleeting, he felt, so easily missed, and night came down so fast on the fair. They went home through the dusk. Before they reached the little wood, the sky was seated over with dim stars like pearls. Stephen smoked, bit his pipe stem, kicked at boulders, and was silent. He had constituted himself the jailer of his desires, and did not like the post. Deborah made little attempts at conversation, but they were both beyond such palliatives of a crisis. They had come to the point where emotions are crude and huge, like a naked land of beetling rock. They reached the place of Deborah's morning promise. Joe and Lily were ahead. Deborah looked up and smiled, forgetting in her joy the pain that went with it. "'It's the secret coom,' she said, where the arrow was. The smile, so sweetly lavish in the faint light, was too much for Stephen. He caught her hands. "'I want that kiss.' I'd leave her not. Well, of all but, do you love me? I, Stephen, I love you true. Well, then, I kissed you in the little wood. Didn't you like it? Not all that. It made me feel queer-like. Stephen was exasperated. Look here, he said, we'll have this out. Do you know what marriage means? I'd leave her not talk of such things yet. Oh, well, I choose to, so I shall. Do you know what it means? I... Well, living with me will be the same. Aye. So if you can't even do with kissing... Deborah was in despair. She had her code. She had summed up life. Marriage and all its cares, griefs, and joys came into her some of things. But passion was new, terrible. She had not realized the feelings involved in it. She had thought of herself as a wife, with the same emotions, the same poise, as she had in her maidenhood. To many women, marriage is only this. It is merely a physical change impinging on their ordinary nature, leaving their mentality untouched, their self-possession intact. They are not burnt by even the red fire of physical passion, far less by the white fire of love. For this last, Deborah was prepared. She had felt its touch without shrinking. But when Stephen kissed her in the wood, a new self awoke in her. She was horrified. She needed time to fuse the two fires, to realize that in unity they were both pure. She gazed into the dusk with averted head. Stephen still had her hands. How did you feel when I kissed you? Can we go on, Stephen? Not till you say how you felt. Fainty like. What else? The merciless catechism went on. And as if I was no better than I should be she whispered, too honest to prevaricate, too genuinely simple to realize the provocativeness of her words. Stephen bit his lip. And yet you didn't like it? No. Well, it's time you learnt to, so I'll take what I've a right to. She held herself stiffly under his kisses, then drooped in spite of herself with the sweetness of them. Now, he said, you shall go on. He walked with his arm round her, "'When can I come and fetch you?' he asked, with the wooer's instinct to seize the moment of weakness. "'Oh, Stephen, do not ask me yet. Leave me a bit.' "'Why?' "'To get them used to it at home, and to get used to it for myself.' Suddenly indignation awoke in her. She disengaged his arm and confronted him, dignified and determined. "'If you do not do as I ask, I do it quick and eager. You do not love me, Stephen.' And if you dunna love me, beyond kissing and that, there's no right road for us but the parted road. I'll do without a ring and a bell. I'll bear with the black looks of all and the trouble of them at home. I, she gave a little sob, I'll give up the name of wife for you, Stephen, if you say so. But, a scarlet flush surged over her, go to an unhallowed bed I won't. I'd leave her die. Love hallows all, she added softly, the kind of love that gives and asks nout. Stephen looked at her ashamedly. But I can't give up. I can't go against nature, he said helplessly. I know you cannot, said Deborah. She was slowly but surely attaining the new balance which she needed, the larger wisdom. I know you cannot, she repeated. I'm not the woman to wed a man that could. Only, 
she sought about for an illustration. Only you'd ought to feel like mother and father feel to me, and like the flock master would feel to the lambs, as well as what you feel as my man. Stephen laughed to hide his awkwardness. A regular family party, he said. Deborah frowned. Then she forgave his flippancy and smiled. Aye, she said, and when you feel like all of them, well, what? I'll maybe give in about kissing. I feel like them all now, said Stephen, and more. Then you'll do what I ask you, replied Deborah composedly, and leave me be. All right, but I want my answer. When can I come and fetch you? Will you tell me on Sunday when we go to the devil's chair? Deborah pondered. Aye, she promised. Come Sunday, I'll say. They went on up the coombe, parting at the signpost. The devil's chair loomed across the valley, blotting Hesperus from the glimmering sky. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 When Deborah got home, her father was lighting the lamp outside her door. In spite of Mrs. Arden's remonstrances, he had always done this since Deborah fell down the sharply turned stairs as a child. Punctually, like a sunset bell or a watch light, it shone at nightfall. Equally punctually, Mrs. Arden's voice was vigorously raised about spendthrift ways. The lamp comforted Deborah now. She followed him dumbly all the week, finding his calm strengthening. "'Deb's mazed, I think,' said Mrs. Arden to John. "'She doesn't do a hand's turn for me. I shall give her a bit of my mind.' "'Never cut love, mother,' he replied in his wistful way. On Saturday night, Deborah suggested that they should sing Lead Kind Blue Light. So she and John sang it in the scented night, while Mrs. Arden, who called it that miserable meowling thing, and disapproved of hymns on a weekday, washed up remonstratingly in the back kitchen. "'The light leads through queer ways, Deb, time and again,' said John, bogs and such like, "'but it takes you somewhere at long last. It's no marsh fire.' August had come on the land like a flame. Only primary colors were left. Day by day the devil's chair shook in the heat haze as though it would fall. Opposite, by the little wood on the Welderhope Range, the shepherd's signpost, blistered in the sun, confronted it whitely. Between the ranges lay the valley, shadowed alternately by each. All round was the restless plain. On Sunday, Deborah had the basket packed with matches for Stephen's pipe when he came to the door. "'So we've come all the way, only to go back to Lost Within again,' said Mrs. Arden. "'It's worth the walk,' Stephen looked at Deborah, flushed and radiant. "'So we were off picnicking.' John spoke meditatively. He never treated trifles lightly because he saw their hidden meanings. A well goose chase, I call it, Mrs. Arden surveyed them amusedly but indulgently. John looked steadfastly at Stephen. She's all we have now the lad's gone, he said. Stephen fidgeted. Aye, we miss the lad, Mrs. Arden shook her head as she packed the breakfast things on the tray. He says to me, I'll be up every day, mother, but I knew he never would. It's not in nature. "'Shall I carry that tray?' asked Stephen. "'It's heavy for you.' "'I've carried more than that in my time. "'Thank you all the same, lad. "'Or where would your sweetheart be?' "'Now, mother,' John cautioned. "'Stephen looked round to see if Deborah minded, "'but she was in the garden, leaning on the gate, "'gazing at the signpost far along the hill. "'Well, we'll be off now,' said Stephen, "'taking command with his usual decision. "'They started. "'John and Patty waved to them from the gate. "'Donna be late,' they called. It was all unbearable to Deborah. "'Hark at the pigeons breaking their hearts in the wood,' she sighed as they descended into the valley. "'How can I tell him at home, Stephen?' "'Lord, you'd think it was a black crime.' "'So it be to mother. Maybe not so much to father. He sees out and beyond things.' They walked apart. Stephen was genuinely repentant, ashamed of his new self. Deborah was withdrawn in the gloom of foreboding. He did not touch her. His look was comradely. They talked about trees and birds and the changing seasons that she knew like a rosary. She became more at ease. Stephen was a strange anomaly. He was too perceptive for a ploughman, too vital for a gentleman. His mind was at present a confused mass of other people's principles, non-principles, creeds, 
negations, but beneath them lurked a poet. They began to climb towards the chair. "'Your old fellow's damned hard to get at, Deb,' Stephen mopped his face. He gave her his arm up the steepest part and was immediately overwhelmed with longing to kiss her. Deborah stopped. "'Can we go back, please, Stephen? I've never been here before, and I don't like it.' The chair had begun to loom large on the sky. "'Rather not,' said Stephen. "'Please.' She was sweetly feminine in her manner of asking. She was one of the women who depend on their own charm and dignity for what they want from their men, not needing legislation. She was not often refused. "'All right, but I'm beastly disappointed.' Stephen turned round with depressed shoulders and a most forlorn expression. Deborah felt selfish. "'We'll go on, if so be you want to,' she said. So on they went. On the cold northern slopes round the chair the heather was hardly in bud. Cranberry buds of most waxen whiteness hung against the rock-like tiers. Not a creature was visible. Stephen climbed out of the shadow beneath the throne on its jagged masses, and called to Deborah to follow. "'Oh, no, 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 Stephen!' "'Don't be silly. It's black harm for us both. Now what harm can come to us when we love each other so?' His words dropped into the silence and were swallowed. In the intense quiescence of the place one might almost have imagined mockery. "'Now, Deb, see how good I've been. I've never once taken my rights as your lover.' "'Rights?' said Deborah faintly. She had always belonged to herself, completely, always been reserved, poised like a wind hover. She looked up at him, standing on the top of the chair with a kind of easy mastery about him. Was it a symbol? Could he shield her from harm, as he said? He was very strong. She supposed he could. She climbed up. He stretched his hand out. "'Hold hard on to me,' he said cheerfully, "'and you'll be as right as right.' "'I always will,' she answered." The stone under his foot slipped, and he fell on to the flat rocks that made the seat of the chair. She swayed, but recovered by loosing his hand. He laughed, but to her it was a portent, and she would stay there no more. They wandered down the northward slope, where a row of blasted trees stood like a broken-toothed comb. Beneath them was a partially ruined cottage. "'We might live here if it was repaired,' said he, delightedly, "'as Lost Within is only just down there. It would be nothing of a walk.' Deborah shuddered. They had their meal and lingered in the shade until a little breeze sprang up. His mood had changed. "'May I put my arm round you, dear?' he asked. "'I. Do you like it there?' she smiled. "'Maybe, Stephen.' "'Very much?' "'I. Then may I kiss you?' Deborah gave him her lips. He kissed her throat, pulling her blue bow aside. "'No,' she said flatly only just under the bow. Not till we am wed. Oh, dear, I forgot. She gazed at him in distress. We'll count that we're wed now, Deb. Oh, no, things must be done decent. She had an innate mistrust of the swift gratification of wishes. Well, I can't wait forever, Deb. He had quite forgotten that he had only known her for a fortnight. We must decide things, you know, he reasoned. Not yet a while. "'Yes, tonight, on the way home.' "'You're so hasty, Stephen. "'Well, would you be pleased if I wasn't? "'I shouldn't be if you weren't so pretty, Deb.' "'His arm tightened. "'No, Stephen. "'I'll be good all the way home and talk about silly birds and things,' he said, laughing. "'We'll go back now, then.' "'He strove very hard to come up to her demure standard all the way, "'but his eyes were so pleading he helped her over stiles so carefully and brought her flowers with such a depressed look that she felt as if she had done wrong. He was silent most of the way. As they neared High Lizos, he said, Well? What? When is it to be? When will you come? I don't know. I can't go on over yonder without you. I shall chuck it and come and live at sleep. But you cannot leave your work. Oh, hang the work. "'But looky, Stephen, I've got to tell father and mother, and I dunna know how to.' "'But as you must, it may as well be soon as late.' "'Aye. Well, then, when?' They reached the door. Pinned to it was a paper. Written on this, in Mrs. Arden's large hand, was, "'Had a call to Black Coombe. Father will wait to bring me back in the morning. Go to Joe's, if lonesome.' 
Deborah had a swift intuition. She snatched the paper from the door and crumpled it in her hand. I've seen it, said Stephen, over your shoulder. They looked at one another while the light slipped from the valleys. Chapter 20 Are you going to ask me to stay to supper, Deborah? he said steadily. If you've a mind to. The surge of joy and foreboding in her heart nearly stifled her. She turned with relief to make up the fire and lay the table. He ran to and fro in his shirt sleeves, fetching things for her. He brought coal and made his face black. Then his collar came undone. There, said he, that's how I look at the mine. She looked at him admiringly. How young he was to be a foreman. How tall he was. What a way he had with him. They laughed about his black face. You can wash you in the back kitchen while I go up and do my hair, she said. Halfway upstairs she stopped. There was the lamp, lit. It must have been lit hours ago, ready for her. It was like a glance from her father. And she had to tell him. The price was too great, she felt. Yet how could she give Stephen up? It never occurred to either of them that he might have sacrificed his principal, or whim. At present his opinions, though short-lived, possessed him entirely. It did not occur to him that Deborah was sacrificing all, he nothing. After supper they talked softly, he on the hearth-rug at her feet. "'I'll get you a window full of geraniums,' he said, "'for our cottage, and we'll have red tiles like these, "'and a chiming clock and a roaring fire.' Deborah forgot in the warm picture the darker side of her love story. "'And an armchair for the maester,' she said. "'Oh, you darling, but I shall want to sit at your feet.' "'You'll soon tire of that,' said Deborah, amused. It was strange to see him there, so bright and eager, when she was used to her father and mother and Joe, with their quiet ways and sober looks. "'I've got something for you,' he said. He opened a little box, and there lay a ring. "'For me?' "'Yes, I didn't see why you shouldn't have your ring.' "'But how did you get it?' "'Walked to Silverton.' "'Walked all that weighty road?' "'Yes, for you. And now when can I put it on? I shall make you a vow when I do.' Oh, I dunna know. The look she was beginning to know came into his face. Let it be here and now, he said. No, no, Deborah, I might die tomorrow. I might get crushed in the mine. He spoke without the least abatement of vitality. Oh, hush, she moaned, and think how you'd feel. Don't he? Well, then, it was the inevitable, unanswerable argument. He took her hand, which hung limp by her side, and put the ring on her finger. "'Deborah Arden,' he said, "'with this ring I plight you my troth forever. I worship you body and soul. Amen. Now, Deborah, I shall consider you my wife.' The years to come, with their mighty hollow thunder, beat upon Deborah's brain. The past, with its round completeness of kindly intercourse, rippled behind her like a lilied lake. Only the present she could not realize. He was the present. He was the future also, eternity. Should she grudge him a golden hour? She thrilled to feel his arm round her heart as it had been at the fair. What a man he was, her man. What a lad, hers. The wind rose and fingered the windows, trying the door, feeling for a crevice. The time's so short for enjoying ourselves, Deb. I know it be. The more she hesitated, the more unbearable he found any hesitation. "'You don't care about me a little bit,' he cried at last. "'You don't know what love is. I'd better go.' "'Maybe you better had,' said Deborah sorrowfully. She went to the stairs door and opened it. "'Look at that lamp,' she said, "'lit for me nights. Never a one missed for three and twenty years. And you say I don't know what love is. Can you say you've done as much for me?' I will do as much, more. Maybe. Well, I must say, he was in a towering rage. The more he longed for Deborah, the more angry he became. He flung his coat on. Good night, he said bitterly. Now you can go to Joe's. She suddenly had a vision of him lying somewhere at Lost Withern, silent, with shut eyes, never to ask her anything again. Suppose such a thing happened. Such things did. There he was now, alive, loving her, wanting her. Now, tonight, any other night, might be too late. She clung to the door. 
her hands were cold, her lips dry. Life would be no good to her without him. And here they were, warmly shut in together from the world. It's as if it was to be, she thought. And now she was sending him away. He turned at the gate with a tragic look. We might have been so happy, he said accusingly. She ran to the gate. Oh, come back, she cried, sobbing and pulling his sleeve like a child. Come back into the warm, and don't he talk in that awful way about dying. She clung to his coat. It was the only way to fight the horror that had come on her at his words. She pulled him in and shut the door. And now, he said, smiling at her in complete unconsciousness of the agony of mind he had given her, come and sit on my knee. She sat on the arm of his chair. Why, Deb, your hand's trembling. Oh, no, I'm never one to tremble, said Deb. I can skim as clean as anybody. I'm a beast. Oh, Deb, forgive me. But you're always forgiving me, he added, hitting his forehead with the unmerciful thoroughness of an actor, but without affectation, for it was natural to him to make his emotions pictorial. Of course I be, said Deborah. His young self-absorption was pierced for a moment, like thick woods by early sunlight. He looked up at her solemnly. Deb, he said, and there was a kind of dull terror in his voice. Deb, if ever you stop forgiving me, I shall be done for. Never stop forgiving me, Deb. Stick to me, Deb. He besought her like a child in the dark. I will that, said Deborah with her warm maternal smile. From without, somewhere on the empty table land, came a long shuddering cry. In its trembling ferocity, it was like the curse of a hag. It's only the owl saying, what ails you, said Deborah. I don't care about these old hills of yours as much as I did, he said uneasily. You've got such damned funny birds here. But Deborah was still following her previous train of thought. I could not stop forgiving of you, she said softly. It's so mortal sweet, unless you stopped wanting me to. That I never shall, he answered with certainty, and nestled his head against her arm. You're tired, said Deborah. Oh, no, I'm never tired. But his flesh betrayed him. It's time you went to sleep, said Deborah, motherliness driving out all other feelings. Her tenderness, the vague, illimitable love in her, vague as rings in water, widening eternally, touched a chord in him that had never yet sounded. Within the rather tinny, meaningless music of his untried youth, this hint of manhood struck out a presage of grandeur. It was Deborah's justification for her sacrifice. He stood up, his arm among the brass candlesticks and pewter pots on the high mantelpiece. Deborah, he said in a voice that enraged him by the way it went up and down, Deborah, I'll sleep out in the shippin' tonight. Rover and the cows are good enough company for me, he added with a little forced laugh. He turned impetuously to the door, dreadfully disappointed that he should feel so flat after doing so great a thing. Beastly stale, he cogitated as he surveyed the inside of the shippen with great disfavor. Beastly stale doing the decent thing. Here, get out, you old dunderhead, he apostrophized Wimbrary. Put your fat self between me and the door, for the Lord's sake, or out I shall go. Oof, what a stench! And Deb never said a word. Deborah had not been able to say a word. She had never seen him look so splendid. He seemed to tower in the little place. It was her nature to see the beloved small, plain doings as noble. For her, when Stephen was most mundane, a nimbus was about his head. When he was angry, when he was cold and selfish, still more in those mad moments at the fair and on the way home, when he was masterful with a cruelty that was, though she would not confess it, intoxicating as the first mad autumn winds to her, at all these times she determinedly saw in him only the greatness. Now in these few moments there had really been only greatness. A profundity she had not dreamed of, had not asked for, had shown in him. It was like coming to a sudden splendid valley, full of deep colours, after walking a bare hillside. Renunciation was to him like stopping a runaway cart downhill. She dimly felt that he was not made for it. She rocked herself softly in the firelight. "'Glory and honour and power,' she murmured. "'Aye, 
Them's his by rights, and he does so mislike the smell of cows. She smiled at this in spite of herself. And for me, she thought, Deborah Arden of the Upper Leasers, with straight hair and no book learning, he's gone to the ship and along of the cows. She thought of a carol about a kingly stranger and a stable. There seemed to her nothing incongruous in associating him with it. And it in as if he only wanted to stay along of me a bit, she thought with a lift of her head. No, he wanted to stay more than anything in the world. Color surged over her. Her hand was on the little bow at her neck. I wouldn't let him touch it this afternoon, she murmured in a sudden confusion of pride and trembling. She hummed to herself the roundabout air, Oh, where is my lad tonight? A great rattling of cow chains from the shippen set her smiling. There's allus summit doing where he be, she thought. Then she went down with John's little lamp in her hand into the dark warm night and stood with it in the shippen door. If so be you're tired of Rover and the cows, she said with a touch of dignity, you're very kindly welcome to bide wi' me. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 The hours flitted over the grey cottage and the shadowy hills, silent as the bats that hung at dawn from the beams of the shippen. Out of the east, from beyond the signpost, came day like an iridescent dove. Out of the west came storm like a hawk. Just at dawn the storm broke over the chair and swooped across the valley, lashing the cottage. "'Give me a bit of comfort, Stephen,' whispered Deborah. "'Aren't you happy, my little love?' "'Aye, but them that's happy wants comfort most. Them that's gotten out canna lose it.' "'I know, Deb.' It was his own intolerable nightmare now, this mist that might come across the flowery way at any moment, with its impalpable, inevitable, no more. Tired? he asked anxiously, as Joe had asked Lily. For to the comely and the awkward, the poet and the plotter, come the same unheralded majesty and frenzy, the same sweet backwash of tenderness and penitence. And Deborah replied, as Lily had, as women in the primeval forest replied, with a weary, ecstatic, bewildering smile. Only her smile was to Lily's, what hill breezes are to the spent air of the plain. "'And you have to go to work through this,' she said later. She was making him some tea. When he went away, he turned up his collar and faced the storm joyously. "'This evening,' he called, "'I'll come and help in the telling.' He squared his shoulders and tramped on, singing every song he knew, accompanied by a rush of wings that rose up before his coming and fled through the rain on either side, with flapping and whirring and the long-drawn query of plovers. He passed close to the devil's chair, entering the cloud that was round it, close and clammy. From nearby a covey of grouse rose with their quacking laugh. "'Damn those birds,' he said, feeling hemmed in and pursued by something invisible." He began to run, silent and shivering, down the northerly slope to Lost Within. At ten, Mrs. Arden got home. "'Well, Deb,' she called with her usual assumption that the world waited for her news with bated breath, both doing grand and all over nicely afore the doctor came. She sat down beaming by the kitchen fire. "'Bless the girl! No more notice took than if I said tis raining. "'It's time, Deb Arden,' she sent her voice into the recesses of the back kitchen." It's high time you gave over thinking there's nowt in the world but flowers and birds and such. It's time you was serious like Joe's Lily, and saw as there's only three things as matters to a good woman the bride bed, the child bed, and the death bed. Deborah went silently to her room and drew out from under her pillow a pearl ring. Pearls for tears, she said. Then she stroked the pillow. She was one of the women who see on to the end of things, to whom the commonplace is transparent as glass revealing the interior of life. She saw, with a vividness that would have surprised her mother, the philosophy of her last sentence. On her pillow she saw the shifting shadows of the future. Round her little bed she heard the years rustle like falling leaves. It was no longer a mere part of her furniture. It was an apocalypse of love. The night just gone had set about it an immortal radiance for her, she shut her eyes and saw a day to come when a pillow should be pressed by a small head beside hers. She saw further, saw her own face quiet on the hard pillow of death. 
I be ready, Stephen, she whispered, ready for all. I'll go with you gladsome in wet weather or in shiny, and lie quiet in the daisies, knowing we loved true. Debra, came Mrs. Arden's voice. She went down. What an old fire! It must have been a late hours, Deb. Whatever for? I thought to set the bread to rise. That's a good girl. Has it riz? I forgot it after all, mother. John came in, shaking the rain from his coat. There must have been a gadfly in the shippin last night, he said, for the minjicumumbus the cows have got the straw in is a disgrace to any cow. The day dragged on for Deborah, while her mother lay down in her room and John chopped wood outside. The rain was a steel wall between her and Stephen. Would he come this evening? Surely not through this. Surely yes. In the bleakness of absence, one rapture filled her. She had done all she could for him. Nothing could take that away. She had loved him, given him of her best. So the ultimate bitterness of parting was not hers. She had the peace of those who know, when the beloved is gone, that they spent themselves and crumbled the stuff of their being for him while he was there. All Stephen's sweet words, his stormy kisses, the pride of her womanhood in being desired so much by such a man, desired so that he forgot to consider her, she reflected triumphantly, these things were small beside the fact that she had made him happy. She had stood in the immortal company of those that have it in their power to give joy and do not miss their chance, crowning the beloved early with untarnished gold and morning flowers. What else matters? she thought. Chapter 22 They were sitting over tea in the fresh evening when a shadow fell across the floor and Stephen stood on the threshold. "'Well, Stephen,' said John, "'a cup of tea?' "'I will, thanks, Mr. Arden, for I didn't wait for any after work.' Mrs. Arden became conscious of summit in the air. A man did not go without his tea for nothing. Deborah looked imploringly at Stephen. "'You begin,' she said. "'Mr. and Mrs. Arden,' said Stephen impetuously, "'I've come to ask for Deborah. "'Only we don't want to be married because—' The objection seemed rather foolish when John was looking at him so earnestly. He therefore emphasized it more, because I don't approve of it. "'You bad, wicked, ne'er-do-will of a fellow!' cried Mrs. Arden in a rush of fury, to try and take my girl's good name off her. And she boxed his ears. John, for all his trouble, smiled. Deborah was frozen with wrath and distress. "'Mother,' said John, "'be silent. Leave the lad to say his say. Now, Stephen.' Stephen had remained commendably self-possessed, though flushed. "'Mr. Arden,' he said, "'though we shan't be married, I swear to you that it will be just the same.' John was gazing away through the window to the far distance beyond it, into things that are not of this world. "'I love her,' said Stephen impulsively, "'with my whole soul.' John looked at him. "'And body?' Mrs. Arden blinked interestedly. "'And I will love her till death.' Deborah's eyes had never left him. Feeling them all so focused on him, he was embarrassed. He clinched the matter. "'I love her better than myself,' he finished. "'Well, then, you're different from most of them,' Mrs. Arden burst out. "'Or where'd the chillin' be?' Stephen frowned. "'Mother,' said John sternly, "'this is not a time for such talk. Deborah, what do you say to this?' "'I say as I love him, and I'll follow him through the world.' "'Not without a ring, Deb,' cried Mrs. Arden, horrified. "'A ring hallows all!' "'Not without the ring and the bell and the register, Deborah. "'Not while I live.' "'Mother,' said John in mild rebuke. "'Well, Deb, whatever Stephen do say.' "'And you'll give all for nought? cried Mrs. Arden. "'He's chosen me out of the earl,' said Deborah with pride. "'Now tells matters.' Stephen looked at her. Mrs. Arden intercepted the look and at once became preternaturally silent. Father, she said afterwards, it's no manner of use. She's hisn. So long as we're all in all to each other, it's just the same, said Stephen. So long, John assented. Stephen disliked his look of kindly pity more than Mrs. Arden's scolding. Marriage makes things no better if you're sick of each other, he continued. Never a bit. Well, then, Mr. Arden? But, queried John, with his straight, keen glance, are you sure you're man enough to keep a woman safe, Stephen, my lad? It's a long road and a winding, and she'll be footsore time and again. 
john was thinking of the lambs he carried four or five sometimes when they went long journeys with their small palpitating bodies and their pathetic eyes are you man enough to carry her though you am weary stephen and tramp on though all the powers of darkness be again you and smile at her still when you're nigh done yourself think lad i am replied stephen without a moment's hesitation think what you could give up for her stephen everything health and happiness yes but there's no need you're longing after her of course not i love her too much john smiled sadly your principles stephen he said it with a kind of forlorn humour your principles about not marrying eh no i mean yes if she asked it she never will said john he turned to deborah well may god be with you and light your candle deborah my child this night and all it almost seemed as if he fell back upon god to light it now that he could no longer do so himself it was his silent comment upon stephen and when did you think of going he asked deborah she looked at stephen i've got a cottage he said the one by the chair there's no other empty the landlord's begun their repairs to-day he seemed pleased to let it and surprised it'll be ready next week deborah when will you come when you come for me stephen well mrs arden broke out tried beyond bearing a more miserable business i never see no jokes no walking out no asking in church no best dress no party no wedding no cooking till you am all in a sweat no nothing she threw her apron over her head and cried loudly and what poor joe'll think and what he'll say and what he'll do and what lily'll say and all their chillin when they come as they will right as right in spite of what i overheard unwilling and not eavesdropping at all i'm sure i dunna know she cried in crescendo what joe and joe's great-grandchildren will think said john with a wry smile is one of the great quantities of things that dunna matter mother chapter twenty three stephen slaved at the cottage as joe had slaved at his he was in a frenzy of eagerness tenderness beneath other emotions was the flame of desire which burns all obstacles from a young man's path and takes him and the woman he loves for its fuel licking up in its course tears and pity and fulfilling the unseen purposes of god deborah and lily different as they were both looked for it in their lovers eyes wept when they found it treasured it beyond the joys of heaven this kinship just at first was stronger even than lily's sense of superiority and respectability though she had a good deal to say when joe told her the news when she saw deborah she made a great effort and was silent she had only been married a week and she was still primeval as a bride is once a great woman always she and joe had come up to tea on sunday the day before deborah's departure well joe lad said his mother you'm twice the man you was she looked at lily with approval seeing that the measure of joe's well-being was also the measure of lily's lassitude she saw a new minute line on lily's forehead and as her manner was to show her sympathy for lily she rated joe what's the good of standing there grinning like a termit lantern she cried when you ought to be down on your bended knees thanking me and lily for making you what you are not as you're much at the best of times she added with intense pride in her eyes you seem to think she continued glad to find an outlet for her anger against the absent stephen you seem to think as you stand there with your long useless legs and your twelve stone six of do nout as you made the world and all in it in seven days like the lord almighty instead of which there you lay in that world cradle no bigger than the dolly in the tub and if it hadn't been for me where'd you have been and now it's not enough but lily must give up her days to feeding of you and her nights of nice sleep as well i'm ashamed of you joe arden well mother said joe with a slow smile when the storm abated it do sound awful i know i'm fair ashamed to be that sort of chap but i didn't make things how they be and there it is john came in with his brushing hook and hedging gloves goodness me mother what a creaking you do keep up he said like a bird frightener and a dozen of corn crakes all at once i could hear you in the far lizos mrs arden was still indignant at his command of silence with regard to deborah's concerns if you will listen to my creaking a bit more than you do john it'd be better for us all she said lily you go up and lie down a while and deb will come and have a chat deborah and lily gazed out of the window 
there was a new Freemasonry between them. "'Who's been dropping a tie clip under your chess and drawers, Deborah?' asked Lily. "'Joe's gotten his. I'd put it away if I was you. "'I didn't know it was there, Lil. "'Where be all your pride now, Deb Arden, "'and your high and mighty ways to me about my bits of carrying on? "'But there, I won't go on at you. "'Can I lie on your bed? "'Do you mind how we knocked about them nights last week, Deb? "'My, what a time ago. "'It's tomorrow you go in it.' "'I make the most of tonight, then,' said Lily. There was so much wistfulness mixed with Deborah's confusion that Lily heroically reserved all her criticism for a future time. Joe's in an awful taking about it, she confided to Deborah. He says he'll give Stephen one for himself when he sees him. I'd warn Stephen. Oh, he won't be afeard. Joe's awful strong. I never did admire them lamp-post fellows. Mrs. Arden came in. Tea's ready, she said, and father and me want you to open your present, Deb. Downstairs was a large box containing a tea set. Beside it, with From Father, very firmly written on its white paper, was a large brass lamp with a rose-coloured shade. Tea was a somewhat strained meal, Joe being sullen. Finally he burst out, Well, Deb, I did not think you'd do such a thing. All the fellows are grinning behind my back. Wish I might catch em at it. You need not bring the chop to my house. Joe, Joe, said his father, never cut love, lad. You're welcome to bring him to my house, Deb, said Lily. Joe was much put out and muttered, I shall have a few words to say to you by and by. You can say him and welcome, Lily replied pertly, for it was a long time before they would go home, and she lived for the present. You can say him and welcome, so long as you don't say him with your mouth full. I'm glad you've met your match, Joe, Mrs. Arden said when the laughter subsided. Joe good-humouredly passed his cup for more tea, for Lily's laughter rang little bells in his heart. Deborah looked round them all wistfully. They seemed too small and bounded for her needs. "'Father, can I look the sheep along of you?' she asked. "'Surely you can, my dear.' They went out into the cool colours of evening. "'There's a sheep gone astray over yonder,' Deborah said absently. "'Hark at her crying!' She was not thinking of the sheep, but of the ridge on the west, where Stephen was making ready for her. Ay, Deb, said her father, answering her thought and not her words. He'll be putting a two, three last touches now. No danger, so as to come for you bright and early. Thank you kindly for the lamp, father, she said, and for all. It's nout, it's nout, my dear. From the house, Lily's voice rang out in the golden arrow, with Joe's bass humming like a huge bee, and Mrs. Arden's cracked but enthusiastic trouble. Deborah and John looked at each other with the wordless glance that defies fate. Above them in the invisible heather, the top of the signpost caught a last sunray. End of chapter 23